I'm Spooter Jedi. This is my channel. I watch the movie. I watch the movie. This is the end. I love you. That was the YouTube channel, The Spooter Jedi, which is run by The Spooter Jedi. He started off his career by making tributes to different media and eventually moved on to making animations and video essays. In 2022 and 2023, he suffered a hiatus and his streak seemed to fault. However, after releasing the long-awaited fourth and final part to his ultimate quarantine film ranking this year, we can safely say the Spooter Jedi is back. Isn't that right? That's right. <laughs> Guys, gals, and all my pals, I have something very special to announce. I am now 20 years old. It's crazy to believe I started this channel when I was only 14, but look how far we've come. For this special occasion, I decided I would give you all something very special. That's right, you get a special treat. Today, I, Spooter Jedi, will share my top 20 favorite movies currently. It's all subject to change. First off, let me just address some things. Number one, this list is not objective. Everything here is just my opinion, and like I mentioned, it could change in the future. Number two, I have not seen every movie in the world, so if a favorite of yours doesn't make a list, don't be offended. In fact, if it's on the top 20, pretend it's number 21 on my list. Number three, this list was way harder to rank and create than I thought. I've seen so many great movies that I couldn't include them all, so here's some quick honorable mentions. And now, without further ado, Grab your popcorn and your lightsabers, and let's swing into this. I've already talked about this movie in my Ultimate Quarantine film ranking arc, which by the way, my opinions have definitely changed on that ranking. One thing that hasn't changed is that I still adore this movie. There's just something so magical about it. Maybe it's the natural charm of Robin Williams, maybe it's the bonds these boys build with each other. Maybe it's a tragedy of Robert Sean Laird's character, Neil. Something about it is just so special to me. This film feels so inspiring, too. It makes you want to learn more about yourself. It inspires, no, shouts from the rooftops for you to do something, be someone, and go somewhere. I'm sure every person in the world would love to have John Keating as a teacher. Carpe diem, my friends. Carpe diem. Mr. Bond, I have a British ranking for you. Mmm, em. Let's see what the Spooter Jedi has to say. I've watched a few James Bond films over the years, about 10 I believe, and although I've watched a lot, I still believe this one is my favorite. First off, I'm a sucker for personal stories. I love how this movie delved into Bond's character as we got to see his place of origin and learn a lot more about him. The stakes for this movie also felt much more personal, as Bond's goal is just to protect his fellow agents of MI6 and Judy Dench's M from a terrorist seeking to destroy them. It's also no mistake that this movie was a great showing of Judy Dench's character. The rest of the cast was incredible too, such as Daniel Craig's James Bond, Javier Bardem Silva, and Naomi Harris's Eve. The action for this movie is spot on too. There are so many iconic action scenes, such as the opening train fight, the subway chase, and the awesome final battle at a certain special location. Oh, and it probably has the best Bond opening out of any of the movies? Just my opinion, it's such a good song. I highly recommend this movie to any Bond fans, new and old. So, as you can see from the opening, this one's a tie because, well, I can't seem to figure out which one I want to put on top of the other. Let's start off with Fantastic Mr. Fox, based off the book of the same name by Roald Dahl. Fun fact, this was the first movie I ever saw in theaters. I remember my dad taking me to our local theater to see it back when I was five. I can safely say, it still holds up greatly. The writing for this movie is stellar. There's so many great jokes and pieces of character interactions. The animation is also fantastic, pun intended, and fits Wes Anderson's quirky style so well. I've always been such a sucker for stop motion animation, and this movie is an example of that at its best. Seriously, some of these shots still amaze me to this day. Like this. Or this. How did they manage that? It's insane! This movie is so cussing good! Next we have the Grand Budapest Hotel, another great one from Anderson. 
This movie focuses on the titular hotel, but also the relationship between the hotel's owner and a young employee who becomes his trusted protege. Ralph Fiennes and Tony Revolori bounce off each other so well, which is what makes this movie work so well. Like with every other Wes Anderson movie, there's so many great lines. Like this. Holy shit, you got him! So, which movie do I like best? Well, in all truth, I think Grand Budapest is the better film, but Mr. Fox has a much more personal connection to me. So, uh, Grand Budapest is, uh, number 18, and Mr. Fox is number 17. That sounds, that sounds good. Yeah. I know a lot of people give Taika Waititi flack. He's certainly made a few flops here and there, but I still think he's made some great stuff. My personal favorite of his is Jojo Rabbit. What an amazing movie. Jojo Rabbit tells a powerful tale of overcoming evil, escaping blind fanaticism, and finding hope in the darkest hours of humanity. The journey that Roman Griffin Davis's titular main character goes through is one of my favorite character arcs in any media. The rest of the cast is incredible too. Scarlett Johansson, Thomas M. McKenzie, and even Taika Waititi himself. The masterful part about this movie is how it balances comedy and drama. At the start of the film, like Jojo, we're led into this world through his innocent and blissful eyes. The Nazis at the start are played as silly buffoons. As the film goes on, the audience and Jojo realize the true sinister nature of the Nazis, and the tone shifts in such a perfect way that doesn't feel forced, especially after that one scene. Holy crap, that scene will stick with me forever. Jojo Rabbit is not just a movie about Nazi Germany. It's about a little boy learning to overcome the evil that's manipulated him his whole life and to grow to become a better person. I discovered this movie one day with my dad while scrolling through Amazon, trying to find something to watch. Eventually, we landed on Martin McDonough's In Bruges. Little did I know that this movie would end up being one of my all-time favorites. Like with Jojo Rabbit, this film manages to capture just a perfect balance between gut-busting comedy and tragic drama. The depths of Colin Farrell's character Ray and the places he goes through in this feature are the star for me. I'm a sucker for the funny on the outside, tragic on the inside character type. All the other actors are great too, such as Brendan Gleeson and Ralph Fiennes yet again. This movie is also insanely quotable too. There's so many great exchanges between characters, like this. He said he was a lollipop man. He was a lollipop man. What's a lollipop man doing no fucking karate? I'm just saying. How old was he? About 50. Well, what's a 50 year old lollipop man doing no fucking karate? What was he, a Chinese lollipop man? Overall, I think In Bruges might be one of the most underrated movies of recent years, and I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't already. I've already talked about this movie before, so I won't make this part too long. Is Scott Pilgrim vs. the World the most emotionally powerful movie to me? Absolutely not. But man, I've lost track of how many times I've rewatched it. This movie gives us such a fun and kick-ass vibe, which I think is in part to Edgar Wright's stellar writing and directing. I basically have the entire screenplay indented into my brain. There's just so much to love about this movie. The top-tier casting, the exciting music, and all the epic scenes that make it look like the graphic novels are coming to life. Speaking of the graphic novels, I've read them and think they're really good too. I also like the anime, which you'll hear me talk more about in my next video. I can confirm I still absolutely love Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. The Shawshank Redemption is really good. The end. Okay, okay. I'll actually talk about it, but I really don't know what else I could say. We all know how good the story is, how good the acting is, how wonderful the score is, that's all evident. I love Brooks, he's great, it's cool seeing Mr. Krabs, the ending is one of the best of all time, it's just such a great movie. I would talk more about it, but I don't know what else I could say. It's good, go watch it, it's the, it's the Shawshank Redemption. Do I need to explain to you why this is good? It's Shawshank. What do you want from me, huh?
I love Ewan McGregor. He's one of my favorite actors, mainly because he's Obi-Wan Kenobi. Hello there! Even though I love him in Star Wars, my favorite film starring him is Tim Burton's Big Fish. Ever since I was young, I've always had such a fascination for storytelling, and Big Fish handles this aspect in the most magical way, weaving the characters' fantastical lives with incredibly expressive scenescapes, color, and light. Throughout the film, we're endeared to McGregor's character as we watch his entire life unfold as he remembers it. It's also very intriguing to me that we don't know if the stories he's telling are true or fake, because they're all from his perspective. A lot of these stories remind me of the tall tales my grandpa would tell me and my brothers. This movie also has a very beautiful ending too. I won't say what it is, but if you ever decide to watch this movie, I recommend bringing tissues. I'm sure most people know what this movie is, since it won a ton of Oscars last year. I also know that a lot of people have even tagged it as overrated due to how much praise it's gotten. Personally, I still love it. I do agree that it can feel a bit confusing on the first watch with all the multiverse layers, which should alienate some viewers, but despite the complex multiverse plot, I feel the writers do a solid job at explaining it to the audience if you stick with it. The multiverse aspect works so seamlessly into the plot that you almost can't imagine the movie without it. What's even more incredible is that the editing was apparently all done through Zoom collaboration. This movie is one of the most creative I've ever seen. The way it uses the multiverse as a plot device to explore characters and take us to vastly new places is so invigorating. Each world feels different from the last. However, I feel like all these wonderful parts wouldn't work without the best aspect, the characters. Their interactions and relationships with each other feel so relatable and powerful. I actually ended up crying on my last rewatch due to a specific scene carried wonderfully by Michelle Yao and Stephanie Zhu. In my opinion, Everything Everywhere All at Once deserves all the praise. Also, if you don't like Waymond, consider yourself an op. We are not chillin'. In my opinion, if there was one movie I think every kid should watch before they grow too old, I think it would be Stand By Me, directed by Rob Reiner and based on the Stephen King book The Body. The film is much less complex than others I've mentioned on this list, simply being about a group of kids going on a quest to find a dead body. What the movie lacks in intricate plot, it more than makes up for with its well-developed and fleshed out characters. What makes this movie so special to me is how well the kid characters are written. I know sometimes a lot of movies struggle with making kid characters feel, well, like kids. However, Stand By Me does not have this problem. Each one of them, from Gordy to Chris to Teddy to Vern, all feel authentic in how they behave and interact with each other. The bonds these boys form and how this journey brings them closer while breaking them down in this process is something so endearing to me. This movie allows its characters, all of them male, to have emotion. They laugh. They fight, they cry, they feel like real people. I think Stand By Me is a movie that everyone should watch as they grow up, no matter their gender, race, sexuality, etc. Anyone could relate to these characters. You could relate to Gordy's desire to appease people and the pressure he feels of having to live up to his older brother. You could relate to Chris and how he always does his best to help his friends, the last people who trust him. You could relate to Teddy and how he uses humor as a mask to hide his insecurities. Or you could relate to Vern, who, while not as deep as the others, feels very relatable in his behavior and attempts to stay within the group through all the crazy adventures. If you haven't, I would highly suggest checking out Stand By Me. To me, it's the perfect coming of age movie. I think everyone here can probably tell that I love Star Wars as a whole. I mean, just look at my channel name. However, I know that not all Star Wars creations are equal. There's the good, the mediocre, and even the bad. But, despite this franchise's messy track record, I still think the first installment, simply called Star Wars, and later subtitled A New Hope, is fantastic. In fact, I could even classify it as a practically perfect movie, and I have a few reasons for that. First off, 
The story is conveyed to the audience in such a well-rounded way that despite the weird story, it doesn't feel unfamiliar. The opening of this film does a wonderful job telling us who the characters are, what threat they face, and how this fictional universe works. It's for this reason that I think anyone can watch this movie, whether it's their first or tenth time watching Star Wars. The characters in this movie are what really sells it for me. Practically every character, from Luke to Han to Leia to Chewbacca to Obi-Wan to R2-D2 to 3 d to R2-D2 to C-3PO and even Biggs Darklighter could be someone's favorite, probably. The film manages to balance all these characters without any of them greatly overwhelming the others. Anybody can feel endeared to just about any one of them. While I absolutely love this movie, there's one thing that bothers me, and that's the special editions. They keep adding stuff like unnecessary CGI, filler scenes, and strange cuts that really drag the movie down. What sucks even more is that the original cut of the movie is impossible to find. The only way you can view them is if you either have the original DVDs, which haven't been released since the 2000s, or if you... Still, despite a few issues, I consider Star Wars A New Hope to be an amazing film. I just want to start off by first saying, I'm always so amazed by the fact that Matt Damon and Ben Affleck wrote this when they were in college. For a first screenwriting gig, this is insanely good. I think their carefully crafted script is what makes this movie work so well. All the characters feel like genuine people and not just caricatures. They talk how people talk, act how people act, and feel how people feel. Of course, the two best parts of this movie are the performances by Matt Damon and Robin Williams. Throughout the movie, we see the relationship between these characters grow as they start to influence one another. The movie shows how sometimes the right person at the right time can truly change a person's life. Matt Damon's character, Will Hunting, is one of my favorites in cinema. The way the film reveals him piece by piece is, to me, what makes us grow closer to Will. We watch as this rowdy delinquent genius is battered down to a scared kid, confused and angered at the world around him. All of this is helped by Robbie Williams' character, Dr. Sean McGuire, who serves as such a wonderful mentor figure to Will. There's also a lot of depth to this movie, as we learn more and more about Will's past, not just through flashbacks, but through his interactions with other characters. To me, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck did a phenomenal job with this movie, creating something I'll never forget. I'd love to talk more about it. I'm afraid I gotta go see about a girl. I watched Lady Bird for the first time right before I went off to college, so for that reason, it's got a special place in my heart. Of course, that's not the only reason I love it. Both Lady Bird, the titular character played by Shao Sharonin, and her story feel very relatable, especially to a lot of people who are growing up and entering adulthood. I felt like I connected to her struggle to figure herself out and how to deal with her life changing. The family dynamic is great in my opinion. The way Lady Bird interacts with her mom kind of reminds me of how I interact with my mom, sorta. I think my mom and I definitely have a much more healthy relationship, but the conversations the two have definitely reminded me of moments I've had with my parents. In all honesty, I think what makes these moments work is how you can understand both where Lady Bird and her mom are coming from. They each have their reasons behind their words, behaviors, and actions. Once again, this is another movie that I love for an authentic portrayal of characters. Lady Bird and her peers feel like real teenagers, even down to the acne. The pace of the film also feels so smooth and perfect. It's surprisingly really funny too. And of course, the ending always hits me in the feels. Lady Bird is just such a special movie to me. The struggle of trying to find yourself, when sometimes you will even know what that self is, or if the ones you love will even support you, is something I find very relatable. Thank you, Greta Gerwig, for bringing this movie into my life. Holy crap, RRR is so cool! Absolute cinema, baby! This is without a doubt the best movie of the decade so far to me. There's just so much to love about it. I mean, it's got practically everything. Action, drama, war, dancing, brotherhood, betrayal, romance, tragedy, and so much more. 
I know a lot of people like to give three-hour movies slack because, oh, they're too long, and yeah, I can see that, but RRR, which I also refer to as R3 or triple R or R squared if you want to get fancy, does not fit this category. So much happens in this movie that I was never bored. It's like a modern-day epic, reminding me of such tall tales as the Odyssey, the Iliad, and Titanomachy. Throughout the whole movie, I was engaged in the story of these two characters and their bonds. There's also a lot of other great stuff, like the Drop Dead fantastic cinematography, maybe the best action I've ever seen in a movie, and some of the most rich and layered protagonists I've ever seen. I should also mention that R3 is the only Hindi slash Telugu movie I've watched so far. If anyone watching this video has any others they'd like to recommend to me, I'd love to hear them. I've heard Three Idiots is supposed to be pretty good, but that's really all I know from the Tollywood scene. I love to get more into these movies. I really don't want to give anything away because, well, I think this movie's really great when you watch it without knowing too much. All I'll say is, R3 is a certified banger, and I wouldn't mind watching it again for a fourth or fifth time. And here's another one that I'm sure needs no introduction. I also probably don't need to say too much about it, since I already reviewed it in my Spider-Man movies ranking, which I'll link in the comments. Into the Spider-Verse is great, we all know that. We all know how amazing the animation is, how spectacular the characters and their interactions are, how sensational the jokes are, and how they manage to make you laugh, whether it's your first or tenth time viewing. There's so many cool details in this movie that make every watch feel like a new experience for me. This movie is filled with passion, and you can tell that the writers really care about Spider-Man and his mythology. As for the sequel Across the Spider-Verse, just like its predecessor, I love it. I had a hard time trying to figure out which one was better, as I have both of them rated a 10 out of 10. Eventually, I landed on Into as the top choice due to it having a more solid story. Now, you're probably expecting me to say that this is my favorite animated movie. I was too. But recently, I think it's gotten some competition. I don't think I've ever seen an animated movie quite like Whisper of the Heart, directed by the late Yoshifumi Kundo in his only directorial work. The way the story is told and the way the characters interact are so unique. Instead of telling a grand story about an epic adventure or a big superhero blockbuster, this film simply tells a story of a girl named Shizuku struggling to become a writer, which I felt very relatable to me. I connected to her struggle with trying to balance her passion with her schoolwork, the way she tries so hard to live up to the expectations she set for herself, and how she gets put in these awkward yet believable situations. Even if you're not a writer, I think anyone can relate to Shizuku. Anyone who's ever had a dream and has struggled with said dream can associate with her. Or they connect with the other characters. They could connect with <laughs> struggle to become a violin maker, Yuko's difficulties with her love life, or Nishi's hopes of seeing his lover again. Of course, besides having well-developed characters, there's a lot more to this movie too. The music, like most Ghibli movies, is stellar. I will never hear Country Roads the same way again. The interactions and script all feel so real. There's also just some really beautiful shots in this movie. My only knock on this movie is that I don't like the poster too much. Don't get me wrong, the Baron does play a semi-important part in the story, but Whisper of the Heart is more about a girl's struggle to balance her life rather than a grand adventure like the poster suggests. I actually like this other one a lot better. Still, if the worst thing I have to say about a movie is its poster, that's how you know that said movie is something truly special. For those who don't know, I am a huge fan of musical theater. I've seen more Broadway shows than I can count on two hands. I was part of my high school's theater program, and I just love music in general. Throughout the years, I've been endeared to a lot of musicals, and Damien Chazelle's La La Land is no exception. I absolutely love this movie. I swear, every time I rewatch it, it just gets better and better. I think I appreciated it a lot more in my most recent viewing, after having actually been to LA. There's just so much I can praise about this movie. The gorgeous cinematography, the beautiful score, and the incredible acting by Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling all come together to create a visual marvel. 
This movie is also my younger brother's favorite movie, which is funny because he's not too big into musicals like I am. Due to this fact, I've decided to invite him onto the video. Patrick, you have the floor. Thank you for having me. I can't put into words the way this movie makes me feel. It feels so old in its cinematography, its tragedy, its sound. Yet it feels so fresh and timeless in its perspectives, its message, its love. No movie has ever used color like this, so vibrant and heightening its story, but so intentional in painting it. I usually don't like musicals, but its soundtrack is incredible, with every song being incredible in their own right. It's a simple story told grandly. The direction is incredible, it's tight in everything that it does. The acting is charismatic yet real. They seem so in love, but their obsession with their dreams shows time and time again to trump that. It's a tragedy yet a happy ending. And the look they give each other, those few seconds, that's cinema to me. I've already discussed this movie twice before in my Ultimate Quarantine film ranking and in my Cinema Paradiso video essay, which I'd love for you to check out by the way, because I worked really hard on it. Due to these reasons, I'll keep my reviews short. To me, this movie is the epitome of why movies mean so much to me. I relate a lot to the main character, Salvatore De Vita, and how he grows up loving movies. The entire movie just has a magical element to it that endears itself to the audience, which I think is helped even more by Ennio Morricone's beautiful score. I could say more about this movie, but I've already done so. Besides, I think it's time we get on to my number one, my favorite movie of all time, which, if you've known me for a while, you'll probably know exactly what it is. While I love the original Star Wars, to me, Empire Strikes Back tops it in practically every way. I didn't appreciate it as much as a kid, thinking it was the most boring Star Wars movie, even though it left the greatest impact on me. I also thought at the time that Attack of the Clones was the greatest piece of fiction, so as you can see, I was not a very bright kid. I don't like sand. Empire Strikes Back, directed by Irvin Kirshner, does a perfect job continuing the story that started in A New Hope. All the characters get more development, the villains get more intimidating, and we learn more about the universe they all inhabit. Darth Vader goes from being just a typical bad guy to one of the most complex characters in cinema in this movie. Han and Leia's relationship is fleshed out, and their love story is one of the movie's best parts. We get to see Luke go through training and starts to become a Jedi like the first movie teased. It's also nice that we get to learn more about the Force itself through Luke's training with Yoda, who's awesome by the way. The audience gets to experience the mythical elements of this universe. However, despite all these great things, none of them are what made this movie my favorite. What makes this movie my favorite is what it did for me. This was the first movie to make me think. It was the first thing in any media to ever challenge me. This movie made me face evils that horrified me, reconsider my own thoughts with the plot twist, and I realized that sometimes the good guys just don't win. I think this was the first movie I ever saw where my heroes didn't get a completely happy ending. You just didn't see that as a kid. It was because of this reason I realized I wanted to make movies and share my stories with the world. I wanted to do what this movie did for me, inspire others to tell their stories. To me, Empire Strikes Back is my favorite movie and one of my favorite, possibly even my favorite piece of art because it changed me. That's what art is to me. Art should change you. It should touch you emotionally. Art should make you think, make you feel, and connect with you. That's exactly what Empire does for me. Is it the objective greatest movie of all time? No, probably not. As I said, everyone has their own favorite. And this one is mine. Well friends, thank you for joining me on this journey. If you liked the video, I highly suggest you subscribe so you can see more stuff from me. I'd really appreciate the- Hang on a minute. Hey, you, stop. Yes, you. I can tell you're thinking of clicking off, but hear me out for a second. Have you ever wanted to share your editing skills with the world? Well, now you can. I, Spooter Jedi, am calling any editors 
watching this video to help me out in my next video. That's right, you get to be part of my next release. My next upload will be an anime retrospective where I review pretty much every anime I've seen so far. The video will have several sections and of course I can't edit all of them, so I need some help. If you're interested, you can go to my Discord server linked in the comments below and go to the channel titled Anime Video Applications and DM me with your top 3 parts that you want to edit. The due date for applications is October 5th, so you've got 2 weeks to apply, but make sure you apply early so you can get your spot. The due date for each part will be November 9th, so you have time to edit. With that being said, thanks for watching the video. Stay spectacular. I'm